And we'll do keep uh, those uh, psalms in front of you as we look at them in a moment. Page 622. I'm going to pray and ask God to help us understand them and see what they say to us today. Let's um, bow our heads as I lead us. Gracious Father, please open up our hearts this morning and open up our minds and give us gracious and humble wills that will hear all that you say and obey you and respond to you as you would have us. We ask you would show us the Lord Jesus Christ this morning and we ask it in his name. Amen. Um, This week, the uh, nations of the world have been remembering uh, more wartime anniversaries. You will have seen, I expect, some of the coverage, in particular, the Gallipoli campaign of 1915. Uh, So many Allied and Turkish troops lost their lives in such a short space of time, and royalty and prime ministers have been reading tributes and memoirs at various services, uh, both uh, in Gallipoli but also around the world. And our good concern for anniversaries, I think, betrays, doesn't it, an appreciation of times of peace. Uh, It is amazing that we live in this country in times of peace. How good it is that we are not in the midst of endless civil war in this country, as many nations experience. We don't have factions or rebels against the government taking up military arms against the powers that be. Um, I know not everyone is enamoured, particularly with the election campaign here at the moment, but um, I trust we're still grateful that we can have truly democratic elections. There is sufficient peace in this country to have those sorts of things. Um, Only about 13% of the world has such a regime of truly democratic elections. The greatest percentage types of regime in in the world are authoritarian ones where there's no such peace, no freedom to vote. It's good when there's a state of peace, and it's awful when there isn't. And that's true on the international scene. It's true at a national level. It's true, of course, personally. Uh, So often, the experience of our lives is one of conflict or strife. Uh, We long for peace, but it eludes us so often. There'll be people here perhaps who are dread, dread going to work each morning because some issue with colleagues that causes conflict. Uh, there may be people who spend long hours at work because they dread some issue of conflict at home. Some of us here fear phone calls from certain family members because of the constant strife in a particular relationship. We long for peace at every level. And yet lasting settled peace is so elusive so often and we can't quite cling on to it. Now these um, three psalms, uh, in one sense, address the subject of peace. And one of the questions that we're going to think about this morning is where do you go to for your peace? Um, If you wouldn't call yourself a Christian today, um, you should know that these psalms, these songs, speak primarily to believers and to Christian believers. But I'm going to suggest the question still stands, whoever you are this morning, who do you go to, where do you go to, what do you go to for peace? Now, as Eddie helpfully introduced, um, this um, is a group of psalms in the uh, songbook of the Old Testament called the Songs of Ascents, the Goings Up. And they run from 120, where we're beginning, to 134. Um, Some months ago, we looked at the last six 129, 134, and over three Sundays, we're going to look at the first nine. And as you read them, uh, commentators think and suggest that they go together in threes, which is why we're doing the rather ambitious thing of taking three in one mouthful. And they probably do come from a time when believers in the Old Testament were making their way up, ascending, if you like, to Jerusalem. Um, Not because Jerusalem was physically higher than absolutely everyone else, but as we say, I'm going up to London they went up to Jerusalem. It's a sign of the importance of the place, that you go up to it. 
Uh, we're going to look at each of them, and uh, we're going to look at 122 a little more. But the first 120 speaks, I suggest, of the believer's experience in the world. 121, the believer's help in the world. And uh, 122, the believer's joy, the believer's goal in life as they live in this world. Let's look at 120 um, just um, briefly. The believer's experience, it is, uh, I just stress, an experience of distress in a world that knows little peace. Distress in a world of conflict. The very first verse, there is the, the believer, he calls on the Lord in his distress. Uh, he's feeling as if the people around him are complete strangers. He cannot sort of relate to them like he relates to others. Um, verse 5, he's uh, commiserating over where he dwells, where he lives. Those two places are both at far edges of the land. He obviously doesn't live in both at the same time. But they represent, if you like, um, living amongst people who are strangers, not part of his nation. And life amongst the, those around is hard going. Everyone else is so different. There's this overwhelming sense for the believer that I do not belong. You read the New Testament, that would uh, underline that for Christians too. The cause here seems to be to do with people's words. Verse 2, save me, O Lord, from what? From lying lips, from deceitful tongues. All around him, the currency of communication is partial truth. Normal conversation is only ever laced with deceit. You can never quite talk straight with anybody. Now, this election campaign, the phrase lies and deceit, you may have heard it, has actually been slung around. Uh, friends of ours were relaying their horror when their nine-year-old explained what happened at school that day and told a clear lie straight to their face, presumably because that's just the currency that they move around in at school. But actually, which of us doesn't know the horror of hearing our own tongue erupting with some venom that we immediately regret? Some spicy blame or a bit of fierce anger or some devilish cover-up of what actually happened? We know it ourselves. The pain here is of living amongst it with those around us. Verse 6, there's the sense of I've had just about enough. Too long, he says, have I lived among those who hate peace. He cannot bear any more to be among people who don't talk truth. He's a peaceful sort of person, verse 7, but as soon as he opens his mouth, well, a battle begins. No one seems to want peace, and it's distressing. That's his experience. The believer living in the world is a misfit, an alien, a foreigner. With regard to their words, there's just no way that a believer can feel at home. Now, if you're a Christian and you feel nothing of that kind of distress, you might just check your speech. Is it different in any way, or is it just like the lips, the tongues of everyone else? The believer's experience will be one of distress. It'll be a mismatch because you want peace, others are for conflict. And what then of the believer's help? This is Psalm 121. How does a believer live through such distress? Well, it's a wonderful Psalm 121. You may know it a little bit. It is to know the Lord God as your keeper. Um, I don't think it's too difficult as you just scan through 121, just and glance over it again, to see what the main idea is in the psalm. Uh, there's a phrase, watch over, which is the same in the original language as the phrase keep. And it comes, I think it's six times. Just have a look, verse 3, for example. He won't let your foot slip, he who watches over you. Verse 4, indeed, he who watches over Israel. Verse 5, the Lord watches over you. Verse 7, the Lord will keep you. That's the same phrase. He will watch over your life. Verse 8, the Lord will watch over. Get the point? What's the answer to the prayer for help in Psalm 121? 120? It is in 121 to know the Lord as your watcher over, the one who keeps, the keeper of you, the one who will watch over you. Now, there are many, I think, who um, worry about the idea of being a Christian because they think, well, I'll never manage it, I'll never keep it up. And Psalm 121 says, well, think again. Uh, Christianity is about a keeping Lord. 
and about being a person who is kept, watched over. We're not actually going to spend a lot more time on it now, but do you just see what kind of Lord this is? He's the Lord, verse 2. He's the creator. My help comes from the Lord who's the maker of heaven and earth. God maintains and directs the world. He has full executive management over everything that happens. Nothing falls outside of his care. Nothing takes him by surprise because he's the creator. He's also the protector as the one who keeps his people. Verses 3 and 4, he doesn't nod off like you and I might do. And as Israel remember their rescue from Egypt, they need to ask themselves, could the God who brought them out so dramatically suddenly let them go? Could he fail them in any way? Answer, of course he couldn't. Verse 5, he's their companion. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade. Where's the shade? It's right alongside them at their right hand. I think that's very important, isn't it, if you're a believer today. God doesn't promise to take us out of distress. Christians are not those who who have a smooth life that's sort of six feet above reality. So often, you and I, we want to be extracted from the pressures and the difficulties in the world. God says, so often it's better that you remain in it, that I can come alongside and teach you through it about myself. Privilege to know God as the keeper. Where, though, is it all heading? What's the goal or purpose through this life? Well, that's Psalm 122. The believer's joy or the believer's goal, it is the Lord God's place of peace. And people have all sorts of suggestions today about how to find peace. A personal peace amongst the distress of life and they might say well you you need to reinvent yourself the problems with you you must come up and be a different person they might say well you need to relocate yourself I, I gather that Alcoholics Anonymous have a phrase which is to do a geographical and it means that maybe your problems will be solved by relocating up sticks, get out of the life that you're in and plant yourself somewhere else in the world. But actually, you can read many AA members' testimonies. It doesn't actually work in the long term. Now, the only way to lasting peace is in God's place of peace. Obvious question, where is that? The focus in Psalm 122 is the city of Jerusalem. Um, Just have a look at verse 2. There's a sense of arrival. Uh, He says, Our feet are standing in your gates, O Jerusalem. Verse 3, the city Jerusalem is described. Uh, Look on to verse 6, and there's even a prayer for peace in Jerusalem. And for this believer, all those years ago, the city of Jerusalem was his place of peace. The king is writing now, King David, and that is the focus of his hopes for peace. Because it is here where God symbolically dwells. The reason the city was so special was because the temple was there. Verse 1, I rejoiced with those who said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. That's the temple. The last verse has the same phrase, for the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. The house of the Lord, the temple, that was where God dwelt. It's also Jerusalem where God's people unite in this psalm. Um, Verse 3, if you just look over it, it sounds a bit like a sort of new city today, doesn't it? A sort of Singapore or Dubai where there's high-density housing and uh, high-rise blocks of flats packed in. Actually, the phrase in verse 3 doesn't mean it's compacted together It really means it's bound together for security. It's built to be safe. It's a place where, verse 4, all the tribes go together so they would know safety. How many uh, family today will know that they don't always get on in families? You will know that in your family. It was no less true of God's people in those days. Their history showed that as a family of God's people, the different tribes did not get on terribly well, to put it lightly. But Jerusalem was a focus. 
And it brought them together, verse 4, to praise the name of the Lord. Such was the, the focus uh, for them at that time. Here as well, verse 5, it's the place where God's king rules. There the thrones for judgment stand, the thrones of the house of David. That's the only way to bring a mixed people together. It's to have a leader. And so here, uh, it brings all of those who are God's people under God's choice of king. So let's just stop there. For, for this believer in the psalm, God's place of peace was Jerusalem. It's where God dwelt. It's where God's people unite to praise him. It's where God's king rules the people. The question is, where do those things happen today? What does the New Testament mean by Jerusalem? Well, it doesn't mean the city of eight or nine hundred thousand people in Israel today. If it did, Christianity would be a very elitist world religion because only those with enough money to travel there could go and benefit from it. The reason that the physical city is not the focus of attention today is because the temple was the thing that made it special and the temple is no more. It has been destroyed. It doesn't exist as it existed. The New Testament actually talks rather sadly about the physical city. No, we're to look elsewhere for God's place of peace. Jerusalem, as it's filled out in the New Testament, is first and foremost fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Just look down that first column of things. Jesus Christ is where God dwells. You don't have to be a Christian to associate Jesus of Nazareth with God. He did God-like things. He had God-like names. But those things underline that in Jesus was actually God dwelling. The New Testament says that in Jesus, all the godness of God lived in bodily form. And if you did a survey on the street and you asked someone, if it was possible to get to know God personally, would you take the opportunity? I imagine many would say, well, yes, if it's possible, I certainly would. And the Bible says it is possible. God has related to the world, to people like you and me, in a way that we can understand. He's lived in a human being that was Jesus Christ. I mentioned Christianity Explored a bit earlier. That really is the chance to look at the evidence for that having happened. Jesus is also, though, where God's people unite. Uh, not because when you join the club, everyone has to become the same kind of person and wear the same clothes, but because everyone knows God on the same basis. Christians are simply those who have had their sins forgiven. They have trusted the death of Jesus on the cross. No believer receives forgiveness because they're higher up than another or lower down than another or especially different from somebody else. They're united because they have each trusted in Christ and his death. And anyone can know the place of peace with God in Christ. Anyone in the world can come clean about rejecting God in their sin and as they trust Christ's death for forgiveness, they know supreme peace, which is peace with their creator God. So Jesus is where God's people unite. You can see where it's going. Jesus is, of course, the king himself from God who rules. So this place of peace is actually fulfilled in a person, supremely. It's fulfilled in Jesus Christ. But also, God's place of peace is foreshadowed in the local church. That is, you, you get a, a flavor of it as you become part of God's people. Not because the building is special, but because God's people are special. God dwells in his people by the Holy Spirit. As you get to the New Testament, the Apostle Peter will describe Christians as living stones. And what's happening when they get together is they're being built into, a, as he says, spiritual house. And gatherings of Christians should be places where peace can be experienced. Relationships are marked by humility, by gentleness, by bearing with one another. So you come from the world, you come from the conflict with colleagues, you come from malfunctioning relationships at home, 
strained communication with other members of the family, and the gathering of God's people in some measure can be a haven. All those who've received peace from God can live peaceably with one another. The gathering of God's people is different. It's a place where relationships are a little more straightforward. Personal agendas are laid aside. Love for one another is the goal. I was talking to a friend recently. They described just the the relief that they felt when they were with other Christians because at the time for them, things at home were so tense. The agenda was always a bit edgy. It was always confrontational. But when they come together with God's people, relating, as they described, was, was easier. Uh, relationships in life can be strained and it can be demanding. There can be no peace to speak of. This person was glad and, and I think echoed, if you like, verse 1. They rejoiced that someone said, let's go to the house of the Lord. Let's taste and relish something of God's peace amongst the others of God's people. Maybe that's sometimes why you can feel more at home with another follower of Christ that you've known for 20 minutes than you can with a, a blood relative you may have known for 20 years. Now, I dare say if you're not a Christian this morning, that all sounds fairly strange. Um, It might sound, well, the church is just feathering its own nest. We're all in a club, we have a cosy time, and it's nice if you're in. The place of peace, though, is not closed to anyone else. It is a wonderful blessing for any who would seek peace. Peace with God through Jesus Christ. And no one would claim that this place of peace, the church, is perfect. You'll know that well enough if you are a Christian. You'll know it well enough if you know a Christian. And I think that's acknowledged in the second half of the psalm. The place of peace this believer knew, this King David, as it is writing, was great. But it wasn't perfect. And so they pray for peace in Jerusalem. Verse 6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. So verse 6 doesn't mean that present-day Christians will pray for the present-day city of Jerusalem any more than any other city in the world. Believers today will be praying that in the church They'll work very hard to keep the unity they've been given. They will maintain relationships of peace. I hope if you're a regular here, you can testify that we we enjoy peace in some measure when we get together. I know too that if you're a regular here, you'll testify that we don't enjoy peace all the time. And so the last part of the jigsaw, if you like, is to say God's place of peace is fully expressed in heaven itself. That's where the Bible eventually brings the theme of Jerusalem. Go to the penultimate chapter of the Bible. The Apostle John is there. He has this vision from God. He says, I saw a holy city. He calls it the new Jerusalem. It's coming down out of heaven from God. And then John hears it described as a place where God dwells. Now the dwelling of God is with men. It's a place where all God's people unite from every tribe and language and nation. They come and worship. Who do they worship? They worship the Lamb. He is the King. It's where God's King is reigning. And as you read about the description, it's a place where there's a total absence of strife and conflict. God will wipe away, it says, every tear. There'll be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, and no more pain. The question to finish for everyone is, where are you going to go for peace? Plenty will say, well, there needs to be a greater effort at international relations. Some will say there needs to be greater self-control in personal relations. God would say, come to my place of peace. First and foremost, come to Jesus Christ. He alone can bring peace with God. And then, and only then, experience the good measure of peace amongst God's people. Enjoy that foreshadowing, a little taste. And set your hope on the perfect peace that is to come, where there'll be no conflict and no strife and no distress. 
So let's pray that we might know that hope and joy in our lives. Lord God, thank you that you are the creator and the protector of your people. And we thank you that you keep your people through all the distress of this world. Please, for us and for our hearts and minds, fasten our joy on all that is to come in perfect peace with you. We thank you for providing peace through Christ. And we thank you that in him... We can taste peace together. We long for the day of perfect peace. Would you make that our heart's desire and our ultimate joy and goal? For Jesus Christ's sake. Amen.